welcome, welcome, welcome to Unscripted Faith. I'm Jay Anthony Gilbert alongside Angela Madden. Listen, we've got an action-packed episode for you today. It is going to be great. Yes, it is. I mean, we're going to talk with a man who has six Sixteen children. Say that again. Uh-huh, 16. Okay, I've yeah. got two. And, and listen, <laughs> the reality is he's going to help us to understand how to bring order and joy in the midst of that chaos. Without a doubt. I'm so <laughs> excited for our next guest who's been saving the unborn children. That's a very passionate thing yes. of mine and my wife. I tell you what, we love pro-life here. And Cornerstone is big on pro-life. But he's been saving the unborn while he was still in his mother's womb. We're going to go over to the set to hear his story. Yeah. Seth, we are so glad to have you here on Unscripted Faith. Thank you, Anthony. Bless both of you. Yes, uh, you know, for those that may not know, Seth Gruber, you are the man. I mean, I tell you what, you have made such an impact uh, for the pro-life community. You have been an inspiration. And listen, we want to get right into it. Uh, I want to ask you a question. You have a revelation that you have shared that has just gone viral about women say all the time, my body, my choice. But you have a revelation yeah. that that is a de demonic play off of the Lord's Supper. Can you talk about that? Yeah, Anthony. I mean, listen, uh, Satan cannot create. That's actually very, something very important for your listeners to hear and understand right now. Satan has no original stories. Okay, he cannot create anything. All he can do is copy, cat, invert, and pervert what God has already done. So all human conflict is ultimately theological. Everything we're facing in, in this culture war is actually a proxy war for a far deeper spiritual war. And to, the, today, I want to tell you and your listeners, nowhere is that more clear or blatantly in your face than the issue of abortion. I mean, the, the rallying cry for the abortion movement for decades, brother, they were chanting this since before I was born, was, this is my body. This is my body, my choice. Mm. Uh, right, exactly. Yeah, this is my body would be the words of our Savior at the Last Supper in the First Communion. This is my body. I break it for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. For I will not eat of this bread or drink of this vine until I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Those are the words of our Savior who willingly breaks his body and allows the innocent blood of the God-man to be shed on behalf of us for our forgiveness of sins and eternal life. So, of course, the central rallying phrase of the entire abortion movement, Anthony, is this is my body my choice. Um, Peter Kreef, the Catholic philosopher, put it, I think, probably the most prophetically I've ever heard it, brother. He said, abortion is the demonic parody of the Eucharist. Yeah. That's why it uses the same holy, holy words. This is my body, but with the opposite blasphemous meaning. So rather than accepting the broken body and shed blood of Christ, for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. Our culture demands that we break the bodies and shed the blood of babies for eternal life. And, and that brother, that's not sensationalist rhetoric, okay? No, not at all. Embryonic stem cell research, fetal organ harvesting, fetal tissue research. And here's the new one that the Joseph Mengele scientists of America are doing, brother. It's called prenatal gene editing. Prenatal gene editing. You, they tinker around and try to edit the genes of little babies in, in test tubes and labs. Now, the baby dies in the process, but here's the justification. If we can perfect the gene editing on the little tiny babies, then when it's safe, we can edit out of our gene code susceptibilities to diseases and disorders and learn to live just a little bit longer. So what's the common denominator between those things I just rattled off? The baby becomes a sacrifice on man's pursuit for eternal life. So, ra so rather than accepting the broken body and shed blood of Christ for eternal life, our culture just says, break the bodies and shed the blood of babies for eternal life. So abortion says, this is my body, I break you, baby, for me. But Christ says, this is my body, and I break it for you. Of course, the next thing he says is, take and eat in remembrance of me. So guess what joke I get from nasty left-wing pro-abortion oh, trolls imagine. on social media yeah. for the last decade? Ready for the joke I get all the time, I get jokes about eating fetuses from far left radical abortion activists on all of my social media profiles for the last decade. Talk to any other major pro-life leader, guys, and ask them, what, what kind of joke and nasty comments do you get from pro-abortion activists on your comments and in your messages? They'll tell you the same thing. Jokes about eating fetuses. Yeah, that makes sense, because if they quote the words of Jesus, this is my body, 
then what's the next thing they have to say if they finish that sentence? Take and eat. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Tell us about, I'm going to give you a date. I'm going to let you run with it because you're a wind me up and let me go guy. 1916. <laughs> Talk to us, Seth. Yeah, so I made a movie. Um, it's streaming right now on X, formerly known as Twitter. So for your listeners to go watch the 1916 project that will rip their face off, uh, Holy Spirit pill them and get them fired up to tear down the high places of child sacrifice like Gideon in Judges 6, instead of being like Andy Stanley and Rick Warren and every other weak, woke, silent shepherd and pastor in the season who won't preach against false religion in the public square. If you want to understand the demonic warfare behind our culture war, then you need to watch the film and read the book, The 1916 Project. 1916, brother, is when the founder of Planned Parenthood, okay, Margaret yep. Sanger... Sanger opened her very first clinic in the Brownsville neighborhood of Brooklyn, New York. For, our, for all intents and purposes, brother, that became the first Planned Parenthood clinic, which right. is today the best-funded 501c3 organization in human history, the largest abortion provider in the world, the largest provider of the pornographic sexuality education that's obscene and vile, that's in many of our public schools <laughs> that's bringing, by the way, angry mama bears and papa bears to school board meetings. <laughs> and now Planned Parenthood is what? The second largest provider of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones for America's gender-confused youth. So, guys, the largest abortion provider in the world is now almost also the largest provider of chemically castrating transgender drugs for America's gender-confused youth. That's one organization who can claim all of those titles. How did that happen? You've got to go back to 1916. Listen, this is not just a history of Planned Parenthood and the abortion movement, although it is that. It's the history of the sexual revolution. It's the, it's the dirty little secrets of the secular moral revolution and those cultural Marxists who very carefully manufactured the scary society and culture that has so many of us concerned to hand this country to our children and our grandchildren. If you want to know why 2024 is such a stupid, concerning year to be living in for, the, for a culture that you have to hand to your children, you have to go back to 1916. And my premise is this, brother. 1916 and that woman, Margaret Sanger, is she's probably the most successful revolutionary leftist of the 20th century whose fingerprints on today's insane culture in America is greater than any other revolutionary that spawned out of the 20th century. Not even Hugh Hefner and Alfred Kinsey could have been who they were and the demons that they were without Margaret Sanger paving the way and trailblazing the path that they would later walk on. You've been lied to about Planned Parenthood, my dear brothers and sisters, for a long, long time. And in the summer of 2020, during the BLM Antifa burned down police stations and courthouses, you know, the mostly peaceful, somewhat fiery summer of 2020, uh, the left went after Planned Parenthood because they were saying everything's racist, so we have to cancel everything. And then they attacked Planned Parenthood, which is like the funniest theater you could possibly mm -hmm. come up with. So it's not conservatives attacking Planned Parenthood the summer of 2020. It's pro-abortion people attacking pro-abortion people because apparently they now discovered that Margaret Sanger was a racist and a eugenicist. So you guys can watch this film streaming on X right now. We need your help to make it go viral to influence the election. And that would be x.com forward slash 1916 project film. And you can watch it for free in this season leading up to the election. It's also a book, and you can find out more at the1916project.com. You'll learn Hitlerian, eugenics, Nazi playboy links to all of the revolutionaries of the 20th century and how that spawned an organization called Planned Parenthood. When I hear this, and I love the revelation that you have on the body and, and even that the fathers um, on the Eucharist, right, of, of communion, I love that because I think about just in current events, what we just witnessed with the Paris Olympics not too long ago, right, and how yep. they used the communion That's right, moment. Yeah. The, and, and so it's just Great so point. interesting how this abortion, this pro-life has become obviously kind of, oh, this is what we're touting. And they are doing it openly in many, many forms. Thank you so much for your revelation and your willingness to be bold in the face of grotesque, yeah. grotesque um, jokes and everything else that you're dealing with. 
Yep, well, guess what, guys? Those who murder the unborn cannot be trusted to govern the born. And those who murder the unborn will one day murder you too, the longer you tolerate the sacrament of Satan, dear church. Satan would kill God if he could, but he can't, so he kills babies because he knows it wounds the heart of the Father and causes chaos on the earth. The angels are not getting redeemed. The third of the angels that became demons, Christ's blood is not poured out on their behalf. It's only human beings and image bearers of God that Christ died for. Satan hates that, and so in the meantime, it's chaos. That's his playbook. And nowhere is that clearer than the issue of abortion. So thank you guys for having me on. To learn more, guys, go to the1916project.com. Watch the film on Twitter and screen it in your church and pick up the book. And let's wake up the blood-bought bride of Christ to tear down some high places for King Jesus, shall we? Amen. Well, you know, Seth, I can't thank you enough, uh, one or well, two pro-lifers yes. to another. Uh, just your knowledge and also giving people education. It is so important. It's not just yelling back at somebody saying, well, abortion is murder, which we know that it is. And they're saying my body, my choice. You get down into nitty and the gritty to help people to develop critical thinking. So thank you so much for all that you're doing. We are praying for your ministry. Bless you guys. Thank you. Wow, when we return, we're going to be joined by another guest who has also got life-changing advice for us. And it's gonna kind of be on the flip side of what we just talked about. He's gonna share with us how we can grow our families and do it without the chaos. We'll be right back in 60. When you give to Cornerstone Television this month, we'll send you Encouraging Words for a Discouraging World by Dr. Jeremiah. Filled with encouraging and inspiring words, Dr. Jeremiah helps you navigate the difficulties of daily life with faith, courage, and resilience. He shares practical insights and timeless wisdom from the Bible that will help you find hope, comfort, and strength even in the darkest of times. This book includes biblical examples of hope that will inspire you during challenging seasons, inspiring teachings on how to claim victory even in the hardest of times, practical wisdom for holding God's promises in your heart. Whatever hardship you're facing, encouraging words for a discouraging world will help you find perspective, hope, and a renewed sense of purpose. Request your copy today as our thank you gift when you give to CTVN. To give, call 888-665-4483 or go to ctvn.org slash donate. It is all about life today, and our next guest is the father of 16. He has a perfect blueprint for managing all the chaos that comes around with it. Let's meet him. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. It's a real pl pleasure and honor to be here, for sure. Well, you know, Connor, I tell you what, 16 children, I had to do a du 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 double take on that one there because uh, that is so awesome. I think it's so great. We're talking about life here. You have the perfect blueprint. You're in your right mind. Uh, you're, you're doing well. So, I mean, tell us about this blueprint. How? Well, first, let me ask this question. Why or what made you guys desire to have 16 children? You know, it's funny that... Uh, People always wonder that and they wonder, they ask me a really silly question. Like, did you plan on having 16 kids? No, no. What we did is we hope to have one more and then we assess, reassess. How's my wife doing physically, emotionally, spiritually? And we say, well, we hope to have one more. And I would always make the joke of God, just, you know, give me one at a time. I'm not trying to pick, you know, how many we want more your decision than ours. And then he gave me twins. I'm like, wait a second. I said one at a time. <laughs> so... Um, but no, we didn't choose 16 guys. God kind of chose that for us. But each time we carefully assess how my wife, particularly my wife is doing because having that many kids is, is quite a cross to bear. Um, but she's remarkable. She's strong. She's healthy. Um, but we take it one at a time. Mm. Wow. So what has been the key? Like we're able to sit down and have a conversation with you right now without children yeah. running into the quiet. room. You know, it's quiet and calm. <laughs> what is the key to having a life with 16 that is full of peace? You know what? Honestly, it's hard to believe, but it's the same that is true for having peace and serenity with just one kid, you know, for sure. And my time is divvied up maybe differently than somebody with one or two kids. But if you're a parent, you got one kid, you're full-time mom, you're full-time dad, right? It never goes away. So what I've done, guys, is as I was having more and more kids and I was running multiple businesses, I've started businesses and we've had some success professionally. And I realized that the very same principles that applied to running a business applied at home. And so when I saw my wife struggling to keep up with everything and 
you know, one day I came home and she's telling the kids to do the dishes and the other kids to do the floors, et cetera, et cetera. I said, honey, I can't just go into my work and just tell people to do random things. You know, I have to have rules and regulations and standard operating procedures. And it's well documented at my office. And we have goals and we have little milestones along that to those goals. We have scorecards, all these things that business executives do. And she said, well, why don't you come home, Mr. You know, business brilliant <laughs> guy and help me out. And I said, you know, you're right. And so that was just a simple wake up call. And I decided to try to see how can I apply business principles to family life without it, you know, pretending like business is the same thing as family. It's not. The analogy only goes so far. But when you start applying the same principles of success that people use every day to make money, you start using those same principles at home to get things done, to rally the troops, to be on the same page, to have a clear vision of where you want your family to go. All of those same principles apply perfectly at home. I've just done somewhat of a creative thing by taking those business principles and applying it to the family life. And when people experience this, you know, my customers and people I speak to, they're like, why didn't I think like this? I was one guy at home and a completely different guy at the house. And I kind of felt like that, you know, like I felt like I was really on my A game at the office uh, because I had to, you know, lead a team. I had to come up with a vision and march the troops along to that vision. And then I'd go home and I was kind of a loser. And so I started saying, how can I bring this home? And so that was the birth of Well-Ordered Family. And now it's a full-fledged business with coaching services and all these other things to help families bring order and clarity into their family life. Well, you know, you mentioned about, you said people will say, why didn't we think like this? What do you think is the biggest contradiction in the way that people think uh, that can help us? Awesome question. I've been trying to really boil down why is it that we are kind of duplicitous in our life. Why is it that when we go to work and you're getting dressed and you're getting ready and you go to work, you're all about logistics, you're all about vision and communication, you're all about hitting milestones and hitting scorecard metrics of success. And we go home, here's why guys, it's because we go home, we let our hair down, that's supposed to be our place of rest. And it is, I'm not saying it's not, but the reality is is there's a bunch of little people You know, I mean, for me, I got a bunch of little people, but I mean, if even if you have just one, there's a little guy there who needs your leadership and, you know, maybe I don't want to just say we'll rest in heaven. Okay. I'm not trying to say that you don't get any rest because bringing order and clarity into your life does not make you more exhausted. It makes you less exhausted, but we have this mindset, don't we, you, you can relate to this where you think relaxation is like doing nothing. We think that's relaxation. And it's really not. Relaxation might be working out or eating healthy or reading a book, being very productive. And so at home, we need to be productive in the management of our household and the communication with our spouses and being very clear on what the goals are. That brings about relaxation. The The reason, folks, that mom and dad are on more meds than ever before for antidepressants and anxiety and stress, and the reason kids are strung out on video games and the digital world and all that stuff is because family life in modern America is very, very stressful. And I I am positive now, experientially, that these basic principles that I've articulated in my book, in my videos, and in my coaching can really bring the stress down and it can run more smoothly and we can all be on the same page about what we're trying to accomplish each day, each week, each month, and for our entire lives together as a family. So let me ask you something, because you mentioned kind of the digital era. In your family of 16 children, do you have digital, like, do they have iPads? Are they allowed that? What does that look like for your family? It's a major part of the system. And so, yes, of course, we're not, we're in the world. We're just not of it, right? We're not, we're not Amish. We're not living off the grid, you know, and it's a battle every day to keep my kids under digital constraint, okay? So I have in my book something called the Digital Policy Builder. And I will help you build your digital policy. Yours is different from mine, but you have to ask questions. If you have kids, you got to ask the questions. What are they allowed to watch or consume? With whom? When? If they have a cell phone, where can they have it? In their bedroom? In their bedroom with the door closed? Et cetera, et cetera. When does that stuff have to come downstairs at night? Et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of basic questions 
And I'm not here to tell you what movies or social media or games your kids can consume. I am here to tell you that you must ask basic questions if you want to be a responsible parent and come up with those answers for yourself. And that's what my system helps you do. Well, I have a question. I, I think this is outstanding. I'm, I'm taking notes. I'm like, I got to get this book yeah. and I got to digest some of this. I have a 10 and a nine year old and uh, sometimes we run around like chicken with our heads cut off, let alone 16. Right. But what's a day like in the Gallagher household? Take us through from uh, the beginning of the day. Well, first give us the age ranges and then tell us what a day is like in your household. My oldest is 22 and he has a baby and my next is 21 and she has a baby. And then we just had a baby about a month ago. So I actually have a granddaughter older than my daughter, which is wonderful. <laughs> All right, day in the life of the Gallaghers. I'll just use this morning. Okay, I wake up. I have to have my quiet, prayerful time in the morning before anybody comes down. Uh, I usually try to watch the other kids so my wife can sleep in. That's usually been our thing. And so about 6 o'clock, little, little kids start coming downstairs, and they're wonderful in the morning, right? Little kids are lethargic. They cuddle with you in the morning. That's my prayer time, my coffee time, and my time with the little toddlers, and it's sacred. And then my wife comes out. I spend time with her. Most important thing, we spend time together. I'll go hit the gym out in the garage. She'll hit the gym. She works out phenomenally. And then I go to work uh, in, you know, in, for the rest of the day, pretty much. And when we get home, yeah, we try to eat as a family, but it's hard because you got all billion kids activities. But then we have a very clear chore chart. And every night we have to get through those chores. Otherwise, things pile up and stress creeps in. So it's the most stressful part of the day is like definitely those chores, right? My wife has worked hard all day long, so I try to take some of the some of the work off of her. We pray as a family in the evening, and then we usually fight like hell over some technology issue that comes up because it's hard. You got to keep the kids off the screens, and but you want them to have some. So that's a typical day. It begins with prayer, ends with prayer, and then you got to have some order in the middle. There you go. <laughs> wow. Listen, I love the system. And yeah, even hearing that, just good. the intentionality behind planning in a family makes all the difference because it can r relieve you of a lot of fights, of you know, because everything's order. changing. Like you said, order. Connor, thank you so much for being with us and sharing your wisdom. Thank you. And please come to our website and check out our free consultation. We're going to help you free or whether you pay or not, we're going to help you. So please come and check that out. Sign me up. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Listen, stay with us. We're going to be back in 60 seconds with more on this and life. We'll see you. This week on Sister to Sister, we ask, are there circumstances that it's okay to judge others? And do we teach people how to hold when to fold? Or do we just have Kenny Rogers come on? <laughs> this week. Make Cornerstone Network your home for the best in local Christian TV, bringing you programs like... To hear news that their loved ones are home, and they should know that we will not rest. We will not rest until we fulfill our mission to bring all our hostages back home. We left the light on for you. Cornerstone Network is your home for Christian television. Welcome home. Welcome back to Unscripted Faith. We have had a time today and uh, we started off talking about life uh, with Seth Gruber and then wrapped it up with Connor Gallagher. You know, there's so much that was entailed in all of this today uh, from life. And then even the, you see one person fighting for the baby out of the womb, another person giving birth all the time. <laughs> they just had a baby, what do you say, uh, how long? A, a month, month ago. A month ago. So 16 children. Yes. Uh, what are some of your takeaways from today? You know, I love it because it's life and life. And I think that even um, Connor's example of being able, you can manage children. Yeah. I think that that's one of the big things that comes up with women. Um, maybe it's out, out of the season, right? They're, they're young and they're pregnant or um, it's not the right time. You know, I don't think any parent ever feels prepared. Like, yeah, right, like right. Connor was saying, ready. he wasn't yeah. like, okay, let's set out for 16 kids, mm. you know? It's not like they ain't done too. <laughs> no, right. They're open to it. <laughs> like, oh my goodness. But but we can, in the midst of anything that God puts on our plate, we are able to yep. find life 
and life abundant. Jesus is with us through it all. So I think that was one of my biggest takeaways from today with both conversations. What about yours, Jay? We know before that, you know, something else that you mentioned, I think he said something really good was he said, I'm not here to tell you what to watch in your home and this, that, yeah. and the third, but he's, he's given us structural guidelines, yeah. which I thought was really unique because there isn't, you know, he's graced for 16. That's right. You know, that's what I said. He's still in it. it to me, like he's yes. in his right mind. He just got, he got a little gray there, but that's it. I mean, for me, I mean, I'd be in one of them, like I said, one of them jackets that make you hug yourself with a tinfoil. <laughs> I'd be a hot mess. I mean, there's no way I, mean, I could do it, but he's graced to do it. But think yeah. about how many families, he may have 16, yes. but how many families even like, how many kids do you have two. again? Two you have two and I have two, yeah. so we have four in ours. Yeah. And so we know how busy it can be for us. Yes. And just having the structure, yeah. him giving the blueprint for the structure is outstanding. I love that. I actually really loved how he said even planning, they're me having a media policy essentially. Yeah. You know, and I thought, you know what? That's actually super brilliant. I had not thought about that, yeah. but it would alleviate so many arguments, so many struggles and want coming to my husband and then coming no, to me, no. you know? Yep. So just having that intentionality of having a vision yeah. for our families yeah. and it works itself out in all these little things. What activities are we doing? What are we saying no to? And how do we get there? Matter yeah. of fact, one of the things that we did just recently, God spoke some things to us. I have a choose fun bracelet. That's our vision right oh. now. It has our um, our wedding date on there, 3-30-12. And uh, that's something that God, you talk about having a vision. I think yes. every family should have a vision. And ours right now is the importance of choosing fun. Yes. Choosing fun in the middle of everything that's been chaotic and all that with our kids, with us, because we have so many different things on our oh. plate. Speaking of pro-life, well, yes. I, mean, I mean, doing that, we've got a pro-life pregnancy center, all of those things. We've made a decision. We're going to choose fun. I love that you're choosing fun because really being a pastor of a church is a very serious business. Yeah. And now a pregnancy center, are you kidding me? That's super serious with television. Some tr television, <laughs> yeah. With yeah. real, you know, really serious things that you guys have had to face, even death threats. Yeah. So I love that motto and I love that that's what you guys are aiming for. Without and a doubt. Knowing who you are and Tiffany, y'all are having fun. We, you know, <laughs> she's the one who keeps it going. But, you know, it's funny though, that structure is so important. You have yeah. to structure your fun. Yeah. You know, you have to structure your life. You have to structure time with your kids. If you don't, life will just tell you where to go. And I heard someone say something years ago. You have to learn to manage your time. Don't let time and stress manage you. Oh, that's, that's so really important. good. So important. And I like that you pointed out that you even have to structure fun. If you want you that in your life, you've got to have it. If you, you want joy to the greatest capacity, you've got to structure your life to make the one who is joy the center of it. All Amen. of these things put into place to give us a, a true hope and a future. So we're going to sign up for that uh, <laughs> uh, that little course. And by, by next time we're here, I'm going to yes. be a whole different man, Angela. That's exactly right. Come we're on. not going to have any chaos. <laughs> Nope. We're just going to be Stress operating. Free. That's right. <laughs> Even with just our two kids, you That's know, right. you may have 16 kids or you may have none. We know for certain God has a purpose and a destiny for you. And it can be found in his peace, in his comfort with intentional living with Christ alone. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.